Well, it's a privilege this uh, week to have a guest speaker this evening. Mm -hmm. Pastor Mark Alcock is with us, and you, of course, remember him from a few years ago when he was here for a Bible conference. Me and him go way back. I don't know how many years, like 12 years, something like that? Uh, maybe a little bit more, yeah. Maybe a little bit more, yeah. So when I was in Bible school, I did my practicum with Pastor Mark in Newfoundland. Mm -hmm. And so that was a, some of the best six weeks of my life was when I uh, went there. I really enjoyed it. I don't know if it was the best six weeks <laughs> of his life, but I, I enjoyed it. And uh, he's, been a, he's been a good friend ever since. He pastors up in Mississauga every year, like in Toronto, and you're you know, you're close to the airport. His church is very close to the airport there in yeah. Mississauga, Legacy Baptist Church, and uh, he'd be glad to have you there yeah. visiting there. And uh, this evening, we're just glad he's here to preach for us. All right. I don't know what my wife thinks that we're the six best weeks. <laughs> I had a great time. I know that. Uh, take your Bibles and turn to 2 Timothy chapter number two. I'm so glad to be here this evening. Uh, I've been out east for a while, and it's good to be back. And uh, this is going to sound weird. I said this the last time I was here, but they hear the horn in the harbor. <laughs> a couple times I've been at their house, and I heard it, and they're talking. I'm just like, I'm not listening. I'm just hearing the horn. Uh, the only horns I hear in Brampton are car horns, and they're not nice. So, at any rate, it's great to be here. And uh, I, mean, I was out here visiting some pastors. Actually, came a little I was out earlier last week to Newfoundland. I had an aunt who had a stroke. Praise the Lord, she's doing better. Uh, but uh, we, I spent some time with family, and uh, remember my son Matthew? He was here with me last time, and during one of the sermons, I made a, I said something about playing games, and he, from the front row, yelled that he was playing a game at that moment. I don't know if anyone remembers that, but that has been adjusted in his life. I just want to report on that, that he has been adjusted. That is no longer allowed, but at any rate, I learned some things on that trip, but uh, and uh, hopefully next time I come out, I can bring my dear wife so you get to meet her, the better half. And uh, I know uh, we do pray for you, and we love the Higgs family. They're special to us, and uh, hopefully we get to see all of them in June when they come up, too, and get ourselves into some serious trouble at my house, Luke. So at any rate, Pastor Luke, uh, and uh, I don't know how this happened. I contacted Pastor Luke, and I said, I'm going to come out, and he said, oh, yeah, no problem. And then... Uh, I talked to Pastor Reese and I stayed at the camp for a night. And while I was at the camp, he said, you know, you can't stay here on this date because it's the ladies retreat. I'm like, oh, that's fine. I don't have any problem with that. And then I get to Pastor Luke's house and he tells me, well, my wife's gone. So it's me and you and the kids. <laughs> I'm like, how did I not put that together? And he never said a word about it. But you can see we survived and the kids had way too much ice cream. But at any rate, it was a good time. All right, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 15. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I am pretty sure this church has heard this verse mentioned many times. Yeah? No? Maybe? I know your pastor. I know your church. Yes, for sure. Absolutely. It is a wonderful verse uh, to encourage us to be in the word. And the title of my message this evening is to explore the word. Before we go any further, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for another time you've given to us. Thank you for this church. Lord, I so appreciate their faithfulness in being a gospel witness to Halifax and surrounding area. Lord, give them uh, the strength they need. And Lord, I pray that this message would be an encouragement to them to help them to continue to be faithful in your word, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, in our North American society, uh, there is a, there's a disdain for the Bible. It, it's not wanted. It's not something that's uh, elevated. If anything, it's tore down every opportunity. It can be tore down. And a lot of leadership in our country would like to throw it in the, in the wastebasket. Just get rid of it. They don't want it. And uh, as believers, we need to know the Word of God. I mean, we need, to, we need to know it 20 years ago. We need to know it today. And to stand for truth, to be that salt and light in our society, in our country. And uh, I'm so glad you guys memorized verses. That's a wonderful thing. That's encouraging. Uh, and, and memorizing is good. And, and it's good to know the names of the Bible too, right? That's, that's handy. There's sometimes uh, I'm like, oh, where's that? Uh, yeah, okay, it's right there. And I go because I memorized it. 
Oh, and, and it's good to know some verses and things. And in our world, though, our world thinks that this is a collection of myths. At best, it's good moral stories. And we know, I'm pretty sure I'm talking to the congregation who knows that this is not myths. This is not a collection of good morals. There's morals in the Bible, yes, but it's the word of God. It's, it's not anything else but that. And within this ancient book, you find direction for life, for this life, and it shows us what will be in the next. Uh, because there is a next life. There's a, there's a life after this one. And we, need, we know what it is from knowing God's word. So just uh, the idea of explore. Okay, so um, has anyone here ever heard of Alexander Mackenzie? Anybody? I thought Ben might know. He was one of my candidates who might know. Okay, uh, what do you know about Alexander McKenzie? Uh, no, I was thinking of something else. The message is about explore. Explorer. <laughs> He's actually considered one of the top five explorers of Canada. Okay, and uh, I like, I, I read this a while ago. And I like this guy because I think he's a lot like me. I'll tell you why in a second. All right. Uh, he was born in Scotland. He immigrated to North America as a, as a young boy. Uh, he became the first European to cross the North American continent north of Mexico. It was 12 years before the Lewis and Clark expedition. That is a little bit more famous, the expedition. But he did it 12 years before. And this is the part where I kind of... Um, associate, or I feel like I have some affinity with this guy, is that he wasn't really scientifically minded. He wasn't smarty pants, okay? Uh, he wasn't like uh, David Thompson. David Thompson explored out west and found all these great things, lots of exploration. Uh, Mr. McKenzie, he lacked the ability to uh, do those things because he didn't have those skills. He spent a lot of time learning navigational skills to be able to go across the country, and he made it to the coast of the Pacific. There's a massive river out west there uh, named after him, and that was in 1789. That's a pretty amazing accomplishment. He left Montreal, just so you know where he left. He went left Montreal and went all the way to the Pacific Ocean. I don't know if any of you have driven from Montreal to the Pacific, but that's a long way. A couple of us. Okay, I've done it too. Done it twice. I don't know if I ever wanted to do it again, <laughs> but at any rate, it's a long ways, and that's in a car. You know, all kinds of nice gas stations and places to eat and lay down at night, you know. Uh, and he did all that going that far by having a compass. No GPS, no, nothing like that. I, I'm, I'm getting more familiar with Halifax every time I come out, but I still rely on my GPS to get me to, especially since Pastor Luke moved. I mean, he messed up my life when moving, but anyway, uh, when he moved away, just to kind of figure out where I'm going things, he did that with a compass. That's amazing. You know, for us Christians, we have an unfailing compass too, the Word of God. The compass got him to the West Coast. Uh, the Word of God exists to help us live through this life and tells us about the next. It's such a greater compass. And, and you know, we follow its direction and we follow its heading. That doesn't mean it's, uh, there's an absence of problems because we still have problems. It's not the absence of trials because we still have those things. But we understand from God's word, as we travel his way, he is with us. That's a big difference. And uh, we need to understand the safest place for us to be is following God's will. So in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now you might say, now, Pastor Alcock, there is no word explore in that verse. And you're right, it's not there. But the word study means a make effort. It means earnest. It means forward and endeavor. Now, doesn't that sound like a lot what an explorer would do? It absolutely does. Uh, I think an explorer, I, I've not set out on a kind of great expedition like Mackenzie did. He, they're moving forward, though. He's endeavoring to do something. It, it takes some earnest work to uh, explore. It's an effort. Exploring is many things. But easy, it is not. Exploring is not easy. We see we're to be workmen. That's what the Word of God tells us, to be a workman. That means a toiler, and that infers that it's not easy. It takes hard work, 
And as a Christian, we need to rightly divide the word of God. And the word rightly means straight cut. I can remember times growing up with my dad, helping him cut a piece of lumber for building and stuff. And he'd look at that. He didn't need a level. He said, that's not cut straight. Especially when you're running low on wood. <laughs> it was not the time to cut crooked, you know? Uh, so cut straight, straight cut for us. We need to know what the Bible says. Not Who cares what Wikipedia says about the Bible? What does the Bible say? And you can know it. it it's not mystical. I think sometimes some Christians have been thought, you know, it's just out there. No, it's not out there. It's in here. You know, get in it and find what it says. And the word explore means to range over for the purpose of discovery. That's kind of neat. I mean, hey, that's for you. That's for me. We needed to be ranging over the word of God to see. When's the last time, don't raise your hands. When's the last time you ranged over the word of God? When's the last time you got into the word? Look closely. Now, not because you lost your glasses and you had to get close. I mean, God in the word of God. When's the last time? You do looking for, you're digging to find something, uh, discover a truth or understand it in a better way. Uh, I, I can remember a while ago now, and this is kind of the seed thought for this message. Um, it was in Proverbs. I was reading through Proverbs, and I saw the fool, the, the word fool mentioned gabbles of times. I can't remember how many times it's mentioned. And I started thinking, I wonder, you know, I should just study what a fool is. This wasn't for work. It wasn't for me to preach. And I'm not going to tell you everything I learned about it, because that's a message all and all, but it was just my time. Getting in the Word, what is the fool? Who is the fool? What is the fool? Can I identify a fool? I've got to make sure that I do that I'm not a fool. And you know, all those, you find those answers in the Word of God. And that was just in Proverbs. I didn't go anywhere else. And uh, I learned how not to act like a fool. And that's important. We see lots of fools in our world. And you know, that's just a little example of ranging over the Word of God. But in order for you to explore the Word, you have to have the Word. You need a Bible. You need to be in it. Don't let it be collecting dust from Monday to Sunday morning and goes back again after Sunday morning service. And, and I want to look at some things about uh, exploring. You know one reason why I think some Christians have a problem with it? Because it's difficult. Exploring is difficult. It's a task of exploring is not easy. Uh, that's probably one of the main reasons, like I said, that Christians don't do it. Exploring the Word of God will absolutely, without a doubt, take time and effort. It will. I'm sounding really positive, right? <laughs> but it does. It takes time. It takes effort. And we live in an instant world, don't we? I don't know about your Tim Hortons. It seems to be going real fast here for Tim Hortons. But Tim Hortons, where I live, there's always a long line. And you ever been, and sometimes you're cutting it close, and, you know, I show up late for a meeting. And say, oh, I was in Tim Hortons' line forever. It was five minutes. You know, but I'm used to instant, you know, right away. And so, you know, instant access to news, for example. We, I can find out what's going on in South Africa by hitting a news site in South Africa. I, I can find out what's happening. Uh, rapid travel. The uh, instant messaging. I mean, I've I spoke to your pastor numerous times in the last couple of years. Instant. Now, he's not instant in returning my messages, but we'll talk about that after. Uh, <laughs> but then there's instant dinners. Don't like them much, but they're instant. You know, and if we're not careful, we allow that instant mindset to really cause us to be lazy. It can make us lazy. Uh, I'll give you an example. So I like to eat. I think you remember from me last time I like to eat. So uh, I like to make Jigs dinner. So Newfoundland Jigs dinner. And I, I used to joke with the people up where I the pastor that you have to do a jig to get to dinner, but they didn't like that idea at all. But at any rate, if, that's not, if anyone tells you that from Newfoundland, they're lying to you, okay? Okay, so it's, you know, all meat, a bunch of different meat, the loads of potatoes, carrots, turnips onions, dressing, but you I mean all kinds of things. And there's a variation in every little place you go. Does that sound like it happens in 10 minutes in the microwave? Absolutely not. It takes hours, hours and hours to get it all prepared. But boy, does it ever taste good. It's so worth the effort. 
And particularly my, my family, because I'm the one who cooks it, they're very thankful, like Christmas Day, Thanksgiving, different times I do it, like, oh, thanks, Dad. They follow up. They enjoy the labor. And to be honest, I enjoy it. I love seeing them eat it, to be quite honest. But the idea is it takes time. And as Christians, we got to make sure that we just don't get this idea, well, if I keep my Bible close, if I keep Christian principles close, it'll just sink into my mind. No, you got to be in it. You got to be in it. It's not osmosis where you just put it close to your head and you'll slip into your mind. You need to invest in exploring the word, in studying to show thyself approved. Study the word of God, explore it. And it, it takes time. I mentioned to you about Google's that study I did. It took me a number of hours. It actually took me a couple hours, a number of days to put it all together. You know, it's just the idea, just spend time at it. Uh, Theodore Roosevelt said, nothing in the world is worth having or doing unless it means effort, pain, and difficulty. If it's easy, it doesn't mean much. Nope, it doesn't. And it's so true. Uh, so a group in the United States is called uh, Lifeway. It's a Christian research group. They uh, ask people why they weren't, or sorry, ask people, uh, why aren't they reading the Bible? That's what the question is. I don't know the demographics. I didn't get that part of it. I don't know if this was all people who were claimed to be Christians. I, I don't know that. But the answers are revealing. The number one answer is I don't make it a priority. Why am I not reading the Bible? Because I don't make it a priority. That is absolutely true. If you don't make it a priority, if you don't put it in your agenda, it won't get done. I don't care where you live. You can live in the most slow-paced society you can find on the planet. If you don't plan it, it won't happen. You've got to make time for it. You've got to say, I'm going to do it. And then the second answer is, I don't have time. So that kind of goes back to the first. You're not making a priority, so you don't have the time. Uh, third answer is, I have read enough of it. I've read that answer. is like, what are you reading? If you read enough, no, you can read this thing every day for the rest of your life, and you still will be learning. You still so much here. It continues. It's never enough. Uh, number four is I don't agree with it. Many won't agree with it because reading it caused conviction. Reading shows you I need to change something or whatever the case might be, confront sin and error. And number five, I don't see how it relates to me. Uh, the word of God is never outdated. If anyone comes to you and says that, you can say, no, no, no. There's biblical principles still apply today. They still apply. He's God's still the creator, amen. He's still in charge. The world doesn't like them. That's a different story. Uh, and I have, over time, asked numerous Christians, you know, how much time you spend in the Word of God? I wasn't doing a, a research study or anything, just asking them. And I was not surprised by the answers I got. Those who were faithful, serving the Lord, had that joy in their heart, they would tell me, oh, you know, sort of 30 minutes or maybe a little bit more, Pastor. We do different things, the personally, whatever. I'm not surprised. And then I would ask the person who seemed to be a little sluggish, not really excited about church, not excited about serving Jesus Christ, off the answers that uh, every once in a while. Well, I understand why you act the way you do, because you're not in the Word of God. You need to be there. You will be weak if you don't get fed. You know, uh, as you can tell, I'm not disappearing. <laughs> I've eaten food since I left here about three years ago, about uh, come summer. And the reality is I need sustenance for strength. You need that for strength in your spiritual walk. Uh, they're not in the Word. You need to be in the Word. Set aside time. I don't know what you do. So this is going to be really a little bit of a practical spot here. You, I, I really has helped me. I can think of as a young Christian, I struggled with Bible reading. I knew I needed to do it. My pastor told me I needed to do it. But I struggled with retaining information or the truth from the Word of God. And the Bible is more than just information, but the truth of it. So I had to start journaling. Get a journal and write down what I've learned, what I've read, and then uh, write down. Um, uh, so I write down what I read, what I'm reading, and write down what I learned from that reading, and then I had another section where I wrote down blessings that God gave me, and it so much helped my devotional life because I'm on purpose reading God's word. I'm reading this, write down what I've learned. I'm looking to God to help me with something today, you know. So the reality is, it really helped me get focused. It helped me explore. That's the reality. The tool helped me explore. And I know, doesn't life throw curveballs sometimes? Let's just be honest, it does. No matter, again, where you live or what your age you are, you know, we wake up late or something's happened, you got to rush off here or here. And I've, I put some strategies in my own life. Uh, 
So there's been times I drove down. I mentioned earlier that my aunt was sick and there for a little bit. We didn't know how bad it was going to be in things. So I left really early on a Thursday morning. I left my house at 4.30. Well, I'm going to be honest. I didn't get up at 4 to read my Bible. I'm going to be honest. But I listened to like 15 chapters of the Bible driving. And I spent some time in prayer. So the idea is I spent some time letting the word of God absorb into my life. You know, and actually at 4.30 in Toronto, there's hardly any, tra any traffic, just to let you know. <laughs> okay. Uh, but the idea is you've got to come up with strategies to get in God's word. Again, if you don't make plan for it, it won't happen. Oh, and uh, look forward. So you get into God's word, you're exploring God's word. Guess what? Some things happen. It brings conviction. That's a, that's a result of exploring the word of God. It brings conviction. Uh, maybe your thought towards someone is wrong. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 13, and verse number five, it says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Conversation is not referring to just how you talk to someone, though that's part of it. It's more talking about the character or your manner of life, how you live day to day. Who are you? So, the, so they have to, how you live day to day. So without covetousness, that's what the word of God says. So not the love of money, uh, not greed. You're not, you're not, you're not greedy. Uh, so isn't our world like that though? If you live different than the world, you'll be noticed. Your conversation, how you live. I, I don't run after money. Money's not my thing. I mean, I understand you need money to, oh man, the gas is crazy, isn't it? That's a different topic. But at any rate, you know, it's, just, it's cost, it costs, it costs. You know, but it's not, the, I'm, that's not what I love. I should be loving the Lord. You know, I need to work hard and God will honor that work. We live in a, in a greedy mindset in our culture and we need to make sure as Christians, we don't let that seep in. And because it could ruin our testimonies and we need to look to God's word to help us. And again, so it brings conviction. So that gets, helps us get it on the right track. Isn't that make you feel uncomfortable? Yeah, it does. Maybe you uh, uh, have not forgiven someone. Luke chapter 17, verse 3. Take heed to yourself. If thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him. And if you uh, repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times a day, turn again to thee, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. Now, the word forgive means to send forth, to let go, to keep no longer. That's what the word means. And so many struggle with forgiveness. I've been in the ministry, it's going on 22 years now, and forgiveness is a massive issue for Christians. I mean, we're so thankful for God's forgiveness. Amen. Aren't you glad the Lord doesn't hold what you did before you got saved over your head? I'm so glad for that. And that's not because I was out doing all kinds of wicked things the world would think wicked, but sin is sin. It's all bad in God's eyes. And he's forgiven me. And as, as a Christian, we need to forgive. We need, need to forgive. I, I, I'll, give you, I'll give you a funny example. So it was a couple of Christmases ago. I made that big dinner I talked about. And uh, since I'm the cook, you know, there's some things you can say as a cook, right? You're like, hey, don't eat this plate of food I'm putting aside. That's for me later because you're all a bunch of savages. You're eating everything I made. Okay. So I told Matthew, I told Nathaniel, my oldest son, and my girls. My girls are not so bad. It's the boys. Okay. It's the boys. And I said, I'm putting this plate, showed them this plate is going in the garage fridge. Don't touch it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Three bags full, sir. Well, a little later on, you know, after you have your nap after Christmas dinner and you're feeling like, you know, I think I can eat again now. I go to the, the fridge. It's gone. Yeah, I wasn't happy. So I walked back in my, into my, uh, uh, from the garage into the living room. And I got to be honest, I wasn't feeling really Christian at the moment. I say, like, where's that food? I raised my voice. I did. You know, it happens. And uh, my son, Nathaniel, he, I guess he was about, I don't know, 16. This was a few years ago. I can't remember exactly when, but he was like, oh, no, not me, dad. And Matthew, there's not a peep. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, right? You know. So I'm trying to find Matthew. Where are you, Matthew? Well, I didn't find Matthew. I found the plate of food. Actually, there was nothing left. So I'm not really forgiving them, have I? Because I'm bringing it up. <laughs> it's a funny analogy of it, okay? Because it did happen. He did uh, do something like that. But at any rate, 
The idea is that if I forgive him, I don't bring it up anymore. We joke about it now. It's a funny thing. But so often, as Christians, we don't forgive. We remember. We bring it up. We might not bring it up to everybody because we don't want to show everybody that we're still upset about it. But we rub up shoulders. You remember when he did that? You remember when that sister did that? Hey, listen. Forgive and go forward. That's the biblical way that God wants us to live. Because if you keep holding on to it, oh, my friend, it will lead to bitterness. It will lead to jealousy. It's a road that you don't want to travel. It ruins lives. Forgive. The Lord forgave you. Praise the Lord for it. So you need to forgive others. Does that mean that you forget? No. It means you keep giving it to God. Keep giving it to God. And after. After a while, you get a little bit older, you do, that, you do forget. <laughs> but the reality is that the idea is the, that the world says, is, I'll just forget it. No, you need to keep giving it to God. If he keeps coming up, say, Lord, help me. I can't think about that person like that. I need to think of him like you do. You know, look to the Lord to help you with it. And it's beneficial. So it brings conviction, makes us uncomfortable, uh, but it, it's beneficial. It helps us. It's not easy, but it has some wonderful benefits. Um, it gives you confidence. Amen? Well, you know God's word gives you confidence. I'm not talking about arrogance. I'm not talking about sinful, arrogant attitude, but rather confident that you know the truth. It's liberating. When you know the truth, it's liberating. You know, and, and not in any kind of worldly way. You're not throwing away truth. It's just, I know the truth, so I know the boundaries, and I can give the truth to you or to you. You know, the idea is I know it, so I can pass it along. It removes doubts and fears. When you know the Word of God, it's beneficial because it removes doubts and fears. I'm telling you that uh, the Word of God says, 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. That, that's a great verse. Actually, I memorized that verse when I start speech class. You might say, Pastor Mark, you, you seem to love preaching. When I first started, I was scared to death. My first sermon was less than seven minutes long, and five minutes was reading Scripture. <laughs> I'm reading it very fast. <laughs> okay. I was afraid, you know, and that uh, it means timid or coward. Uh, I can remember when I first got saved, I was scared to, to witness to an atheist. I can re distinctly remember this in my life. I was afraid because I, I, I didn't know, like, how do you do that? And, but you know, you get in God's word, it does help you. Is I have witnessed atheists. And they're not nearly as afraid or scary as I thought they would be, you know? And sometimes it's all oh, the devil's working on you too, but you get in God's word and you see those doubts and fears removed in your life. And I'll be honest with the atheists I've witnessed too. It's all, it almost exclusively, they've been mistreated or abused by the religious leaders in that system that they were in. That seems to be the overriding issue that leads to bitterness and so forth. Hey, I don't, uh, I don't uh, stay up night waiting, thinking, am I still saved? I accepted Christ as a Savior. I never fear that, that I'll lose it. Because the Word of God tells me, once I'm saved, I'm always saved. So isn't that a beneficial thing? You know it. And there's, you know, there's a lot of Christians out there who are afraid, or they don't know, they don't understand. Can I lose it? I mean, what, what, how's that all work? Well, getting God's Word, and it's liberating, because I know the truth. It fortifies our mind. To stand against attacks. So it helps us with the doubts and fears personally. It fortifies our heart and mind against the attacks that come. And man, they're rampant. There's so many things that are attacking Christianity. Uh, I don't know what it's like around here in Halifax, but in my neck of the woods, there's all these prosperity gospel preachers and teaching their foolishness and charismatic things. And uh, really, the, the prosperity thing is huge. And they're dead wrong. They're dead wrong. Uh, in Mark chapter 10, Jesus deals with a young rich ruler who wants the eternal life so long as he isn't asked to sacrifice, right? The Lord says, you know, you, know, you have to accept me and things. And, you know, he, he wasn't willing to give it all, all away to follow Christ. He's disheartened. He goes away sorrowful for he, for he had great possessions. His attitude with Christ was really the problem, not the riches. He didn't want to give it up. Follow Christ. It's not about prosperity. If you're going to follow Christ, you're probably going to lose things at processions. There's a possibility, but what you gain is phenomenal. You know, it's not, uh, I get a million dollars in my checking account once I accept Christ as Savior. No, you have eternity in heaven. That's so much greater. 
than the foolishness they get on with. You know, and we need to make sure that we, uh, you know, God might bless us with wealth, but that's not a sign of God's blessing in the sense we can work hard and be cheating. We could cheat and make money. That's not how God operates, right? That's not how God wants us to do it. We need to make sure that we're following Lord Jesus Christ. It's not about prosperity gospel. And, and I, I don't, again, I don't know what happened around here in Halifax and things during the last few years, but end times confusion is rampant. Well, you know, I'm so glad that I can get in God's word and I know exactly what God's timetable is. I don't have to worry about it. I mean, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to the rapture. Uh, first Timothy chapter four, or first Thessalonians, sorry, uh, chapter four. Hey, the moment the Lord calls church home, I'm out of here, gone. As quick as that, blink of an eye. And then the timetable for the tribulation starts. And then after that, the, the millennial, the Lord, you know, it's a, you can see it all there. It's not mystical, but you got to get in it and explore it to study it, to see what's there. That's what you need to do. It gives us strength to stand in our world. Our world's upside down, is it not? You know, I'm sure I could talk to some of the folks you've been around. You, you're, you're, you're not, you're mature. Okay. I have a, my father in law is 89. He says, Don't you ever call me old. Just call me mature. Yes, sir. That's what I'll call you. You're mature. Okay. You've seen some crazy differences in our world, in our country, Canada. You've seen morals just <laughs> go away. And incredible fast as well. Now, without a doubt, you know, God has morals. Biblical truths, principles, immoral behavior outside of marriage, God doesn't want it. He prohibits it. Don't do it. Uh, and our world's out of touch with that. And God uh, ordained marriage. That's God, you know, Adam and Eve. You know, that's what God said. You can get in God's word and see what he has planned for marriage. You can see what God has plans for relationships. You know, how we should act, how we should interact. You know, uh, the womb, abortion's wrong. You know, you see it all over the news. It's still wrong. It doesn't matter what laws a country might pass. God says life. It's precious. Don't murder. It's true. That's what God's word says. And it's, this is another one that uh, really, uh, I don't know, again, around here, but from my neck of the woods, you hear it all the time. So the environment, okay, global warming. It didn't show up in my neck of the woods this year, uh, this winter, but they talk about the end of the world is coming. Another 15 years, it's all over. You know, that's a lie. If you know God's timetable, you know we have way more than 15 years. You, let's, let's do a little math. So if the rapture happened right now, it'd be fantastic. Then it's seven years of the tribulation. And then after the seven years of tribulation, we call the millennial. How, do, how many years is that? A thousand. That's not 15 years. <laughs> okay. I'm not good at the maths. I know that. Okay, the reality is we know God's word. It helps us. Should we be wise stewards of what God has given us here on earth? Absolutely. I'm from Newfoundland. I can remember when they closed down the cod fishery. He's overfishing. That was not wise stewardship, right? Bad stewardship. I remember hundreds, if not thousands of people moving away for work because we weren't wise. So God's word, again, shows us how we should act, how we should uh, work uh, with according to his plan. The word of God is a lamp. That word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. It's a shield for us. It's profitable to know. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's profitable for doctrine, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. There is amazing benefits from exploring the word of God. And I, and I understand that it can be hard, but it's, a, it's amazing benefits. And let me encourage you to encourage someone else to explore the word. Tell someone about what you've learned in God's word. Maybe you can talk to uh, maybe an unsaved individual say, hey, I know this is what God's word says about the future. Right now, a lot of people are worried about the future. Now, I'm not saying there's nothing that we shouldn't be concerned about, but I know God's word. God has a plan. He's going to take care of me and watch out, and he's got a plan for the entire world. And, and obviously, the book is ancient. No one's around that was involved with the writing thereof, of the scriptures. But it's a companion for us, just like it was a companion for the first century Christians. It is for us today in 2022. It has side effects. It's beneficial and it has side effects. Have you ever seen those commercials for new medicines? They say, uh, if you will take this medicine, you will lose weight. Um, 
maybe reduce your blood pressure and so on. So I have absolutely, I should say absolutely, I have no training, absolutely no training in medical world. I understand some medicines, but I have no training in medicine. Okay, none, zero. But when I hear about the side effects, you get headaches, could be vomiting, joint pain, dizziness, and so on. Again, I'm not a medical expert, but if I got a bad head, I don't want to eat. If my stomach's upset, I don't want to eat. So the pill does the job of what the side effects of making me lose weight. Uh, the reality is there's no bad side effects for you spending time in God's word. Zero. Now, I understand you got to take your responsibilities. You're not going to go lock yourself in the room for four years and not take care of your family. We're not talking anything like that, but you will have no bad side effects from being in God's word. No way. It's going to help you. It's going to help you grow. And you will be, you know, this is what I find as people get in God's word. You're going to want to provoke others. Now, usually we use that word provoke uh, when we're siblings. He provoked me. You know, she made me, well, what we're saying, she made me do it. You know, the reality is here, provoke in, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 says, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and good works. I have found that Christians who spend time in God's word, they're trying to provoke others to do the same thing. Come on with me in this journey. Let's go explore. Maybe we don't explore together, but we can talk about what we're exploring in God's Word. It's a great journey. It's one that, and I, I'm afraid sometimes our younger generations think that the Bible's boring. The Bible is alive. It's amazing, and we need to be in it. And, and I understand as a little child, you won't understand all concepts, but you can build upon what you do know. And as we become adults and, and, and we grow and things of that nature, we learn even more. And let me encourage you, like I said earlier, encourage someone, provoke someone to explore the word. No one made Alexander McKenzie explore to find the Pacific. He didn't show up at his job place in Montreal and the guy's like, his boss said, you need to go explore. That's not what happened. He made a decision. He made a decision. He learned how to use the compass. How do I use a compass to get across this land? He left for the Pacific for Montreal on October the 10th, 1792. He arrived on the coast of British Columbia on July 22nd, 1793. That is nine months of exploring. That's one way. <laughs> you didn't get there and have the train back, <laughs> okay? You got to come all the way back again. That, is a, that was an incredible amount of work. And that was some pretty cold times too, right? Like that's the winter, you know? And he didn't have the nice jackets, didn't have the nice shoes. And, there was no roll-up sleeping bags or anything like that. I'm sure it rained, snowed, did all kinds. Maybe it was flooding along the way. I, I think he had about 30 men that went with him and things, but it was a big journey. Now, in contrast to exploring the Word, we explore the Word way more than nine months. Exploring the Word is a lifetime as Christians. We do it for a lifetime. Or we should be doing it. It's a lifetime of exploration, and exploring will not be easy. Uh, you'll need to, again, make that time, make it part of what, who you are, make, put that effort in. Uh, and it's, again, get, try to, uh, how do you word, refresh your mind that this is not instant, but this is going to take time, it's, but it's worth it. You need to be a workman. And though it might be difficult, it's worth it. it will, you'll never exceed the capacity for scripture. There might be times you put down the Bible, like, man, I don't understand all that. I need to study that more. Yes. But you'll never reach a point like, okay, now I'm full. I don't need to read the Bible anymore. Okay, you'll never reach that. That's not attainable. Okay, that, that's not a purpose for reading the Bible. And just don't say, well, I'll read the Bible through once and I'm good for the year. No, 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 no. Read it all the time. <laughs> Listen to it. Uh, get it on your phone or whatever you can. Be in, inundated with the Word of God. I don't want to be inundated with the world stuff. Get that away. I want to be inundated by the, trip, the Scripture. What is true? And uh, there'll be times when you'll be convicted. I'm going to tell you right now. There's things that are going to come up. I can think of my own, in my own life that I've been convicted about something. Maybe I said something to somebody in the wrong kind of way. I can remember this one time in particular. Uh, I, I was you know, reading through forgiveness and things and getting things right with people. I can't remember exactly the portion of scripture. And instantly it came to mind about something I said to someone when I was growing up. When I was like 15, 16. And it was me. And I know that it hurt the person I said, said it about. And I 
sucked it up bubber cup and sent an apology to them. He said, I'm sorry. Actually, I said, sorry. You shouldn't say I apologize. Well, apology is a legal term. God says, forgive, ask for forgiveness. That's what you need. So I asked that person for forgiveness. And the person's like, I don't even remember that happening, but I forgive you. Yeah, it was great. And, and I'm glad that that person had that attitude. I'm glad I didn't ruin their life what I said. I didn't think of that nature. It wasn't like that life-changing, but the idea is you'll get convicted. But isn't it great that you get things right and you're a little bit closer to the Lord? That barrier is removed. It has so many benefits. It's liberating. You're knowing the truth. It's exciting. It will fortify your mind. We live in a world where everything is wishy-washy all over the place. You'll know, you know God's word. It'll help you stand against false doctrine. And that's pervasive in our world. In our churches, it's getting in big time, and we need to know the truth. Help you fight off those things. And, and again, don't ever view it as, all oh, this, I have to do this again. And there's going to be days, I'm pretty sure that Mackenzie, if he was here, he'd give us a testimony that some days like, oh, I don't want to get out of my bed today. But keep at it. Get up anyway. Get, get in the Word anyway. Keep exploring the Word anyway. And uh, you will not be disappointed. But more importantly, you'll be honoring the Lord. You'll be honoring Him. Explore the word. Dear Jesus, thank you for this time to be in your word. And Lord, thank you for the attendance of the folks here. And I'm thankful for their heart for you. Help us all to be determining in our hearts and lives that we will explore the word. We'll spend time knowing it, gleaning from it, and ultimately bringing you honor and glory. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.